Borderlands games are known for a lot of things. Gunplay, gameplay, innuendos, and the wild cast of characters involved. But for diehard players who look for a greater challenge, Borderlands games are also known for in-game content, especially raid bosses. But what is a raid boss in the Borderlands universe? According to the Borderlands Wikipedia, which is not always the greatest source, a raid boss is a specialized boss which is designed to be fought by multiple players, typically of significantly higher difficulty than normal bosses, and requiring specialized strategy and or loadouts. One thing that the wiki doesn't say is that they generally have the word invincible in their name, or at least they did for Borderlands 1 and 2. However, Borderlands 3 changed the formula and snuck in some raid bosses into the final version of the game, ultimately giving us 17 raid boss difficulty enemies, so let's break them down. Starting off with two of the lesser known raid boss level enemies that you can fight in the base game of Borderlands 3. Gearbox permanently added in the seasonal events into the game for anybody who owns the base game and this means you can switch the active event on the character select screen to bloody harvest or revenge of the cartels and take on captain haunt or joey ultraviolet respectively both of which received huge boosts to their health and damage turning them into raid bosses themselves now to start the bloody harvest so you can fight haunt you will need to enable the event and then talk to maurice in sanctuary to start it he will have you hunt for hectoplasm by killing haunted enemies wherever you want to go for this the easiest way to get that hectoplasm is to just go to the slaughter shaft or if you've already unlocked DLC 1, the compactor map where you have the scrap trap room, you can go in there and get it pretty quick there too. But that said, you can go to any map and farm Hectoplasm. It doesn't have to be those. They're just the quickest ones. Then you head back to Maurice, give him the Hectoplasm. He opens up a portal to Heck where you can go and battle your way to Captain Haunt. Defeating Haunt will land you some sweet loot most of the time. He can drop the Gas Call Grenade, one of the best grenades in the game, or the Fear Monger Shotgun, which actually got a 355% weapon damage buff back in October of 2020, so don't sleep on that however haunt can also drop two absolute dud items in the stalker sniper rifle and the overflowing scream of terror shield which can't even be anointed the stalker like the fear monger did receive a huge buff of 400 weapon damage in october of 2020 but it still lacks that wow factor you expect in a legendary sniper haunt will always drop one of the four dedicated drops meaning each item does have a 25 percent drop chance from him now for the cartels and joey ultraviolet you just need to enable the cartels event at the character select screen and then go talk to marie and sanctuary similarly to bloody harvest event you will need to go gather things by killing enemies in the wild returning to maurice who once again opens a portal for you this time to vila ultraviolet and one of the most beautiful maps in borderlands history the entire vibe of vila ultraviolet is a 10 out of 10 the music the scenery the enemy diversity and variety and then you have a bunch of named enemies to fight along the way that all have dedicated drops this event is quite literally perfection now doing the quest will lead you on the most direct path to fight joey but you can also head to each extremity of the map and fight the other named enemies if you'd like just another way to score even more loot since this event also has some of the best loot in the game for the joey fight you'll have to take on two of his random mini bosses based on which other named mini bosses have already spawned elsewhere on the map so you can effectively pick and choose who you want to fight along with joey by saving and quitting until you get the two that you want i recommend franco firewall and either fish slap or tenderizer depending on what kind of gear you want franco can drop the opq and the needle gun fish slap drops the yellow cake and the fish slap grenade which is one of the strongest grenades in the game and tenderizer drops the grease trap and the no pew pew the grease trap is one of the strongest weapons in the game for the clone zane build joey's no pushover so make sure that when you enter this fight you have max ammo and a couple of strong weapons in case one runs out of ammo once defeated joey has a 11 percent drop chance to drop any of the cartel dedicated drops next let's talk about one of the greatest pieces of in-game content in the history of borderlands the malawan takedown down. From start to finish, this is a masterpiece in design. The Valkyries are the first big challenge, and their combined health is below that of all the other enemies on this list, but they are a boss within the raid, so it's worth noting them. They can be quite challenging for some players, especially in the first and last phases, where all three of them are together on the platform attacking you. Once you do defeat them, however, you will battle your way through a couple more areas of mobs in some of the most intense mobbing you will find in any Borderlands game. After clearing all of that out, you get to take on Wotan the Invincible. Now, now, Wotan is one of the best all-around raid boss fights in Borderlands history. Between his attacks, movement, and shield variety that you have to overcome, forcing you to move and even use jump pads at one point, then he splits into a second form, the better half, which is increasing the challenge since it flies around, summoning in more enemies and shooting you at range. Everything about this fight is truly amazing, except for the loot at the end. 
game, which, you know, again, that seems to be a problem across all Borderlands games when you fight raid bosses, most of their loot is disappointing. Now to the less popular takedown, the Guardian takedown. Now wait, don't click off the video, I'm just gonna jump to the good parts. Anathema and Scourge fights are fun, at least for me, I know a lot of people hate how many immune phases Anathema has, but what I liked about it is you weren't just sitting there waiting for it to end, and you weren't just sitting there pumping him full of bullets, you had to move and hit jump pads and then take your time and jump back, it was truly like a traditional raid boss fight interesting mechanics that once you learn you can master them and scourge with his arena full of varied enemies and teleporting you to various locations to fight your way back breaking the crystals to release him i love this fight too i just wish that the loot for this takedown was better one thing to note for anybody who hasn't done this takedown in a while gearbox did remove two of the annoying platforming sections in this takedown replacing them with jump pads that land you into the next area taking some of the annoyance out of it up next hemavorous and vermivorous now to access this fight you need to grab the mission you will die over and over from Claptrap and Sanctuary. Make sure that you grab the 500 Iridium out of this container right here. You'll need that to enter the fight. Then head to Ascension Bluff and to this spot on your map where you can enter Dark Thirst Dominion. When you enter that area, make sure that you trigger the fast travel station so that you can travel there directly in future attempts. This is one of the most intense boss fights in all of Borderlands. You'll be under constant attack, blinded by effects. You'll need to have a pretty good spatial awareness. You can kill a Hemophorus or Vermivorous first. It doesn't matter. You can work on a both at the same time whatever you would like to do in there both will take flight when you get them to half health so keep that in mind if you want to see how i beat them then check out my level 72 mayhem 10 and 11 build guide playlist for the gear and build recommendations if you kill hemavorous and leave vermivorous alive then you can fast travel back up to the starting area of this map and then come back down into the arena and fight hemavorous again without having to pay that 500 iridium entry fee there's actually no advantage to killing vermivorous as they don't even have a dedicated drop which again another huge mistake in terms of like raid boss loot. Now on to something that might be considered a little bit more controversial in this video. There are six proving grounds, each with its own unique boss at the end. On November 21st of 2021, Gearbox implemented a switch at the beginning of each of these proving grounds, allowing you to take on a raid boss version of the final boss at the end. Each of these bosses have crazy health values, unique arena, mobs nearby for you to second wind off of. They also drop valuable in-game worthy loot, things like the Skull Masher, the Lucky Seven, the Flipper, Chaos and Convergence, Maggie, Sickle, Backburn, Tizzy, Monarch, and the underappreciated Atlas Replay. If you've only taken on these bosses before the True Trials option was added, then let me tell you, these bosses got their health increased into the billions and a substantial increase to their damage as well. Think of the True Trials maps like miniature takedowns with some of the best loot in the game. If you've never done any of the Proven Grounds, then check out my guide showing you how to find each of them by clicking the card in the upper right hand corner of the screen right now. Like Captain Haunt and Joey Ultraviolet, these bosses received huge boosts through their health and damage values if you enable that true difficulty switch before entering the trial, the biggest of which being the Hag of Fervor, who now has almost twice as much health as both Scourge and Hemavorous. The Arbalist of Discipline, the Tyrant of Instinct, the Skag of Survival, and the Tink of Cunning all have a respectable 8.5 billion HP. The Seraph of Supremacy comes in with 7 billion. And like I said before, each of these bosses have their own unique arenas with mobs nearby for second wind each has unique legendary loot pools and they each have lootable red chests that will guarantee legendary loot if you beat them making these six enemies some of the toughest and most rewarding raid bosses in all of borderlands let's jump down to a couple of enemies in the fourth dlc psycho creek and the fantastic fuster cluck starting with the easter egg enemy who's a bit off the normal path sponge boss sponge boss has a daunting 3.2 billion hp some powerful attacks and can even evolve into a godliath version if you shoot his helmet off and let him evolve killing nearby enemies it's easy to get overwhelmed by sponge boss with his small area to fight in and his powerful attacks making him a pretty tough fight for the average player then there's psycho reaver with 3.9 billion hp multiple phases in a cool boss arena not to mention the wild treasure room that you get upon defeating him one of the coolest treasure rooms in all of borderlands unfortunately it is on a timer that part I don't like. Now keep in mind some weapons can't reach his final phase and some action skills are worthless versus his final phase like Zane's clone, Amara's phase slam, and phase flare for example, but this fight is a lot of fun besides those minor setbacks. Now on to the final boss of the mysterious leader side quest, the Ava Murder Mysteries from the director's cut, the Seer. Seer has a 10.6 billion health value which is almost more than Haunt, Joey, and Wotan combined. The Seer doesn't get enough credit for being as tough as it is and the missions that lead up to this fight and then continue after defeating seer are some of the most important groundwork pieces of story we've had in borderland
Borderlands 3. Sears Arena is one of the coolest looking in the game, and their mobs are enough of a nuisance to make this an interesting fight. And finally, the only other quote unquote invincible boss in the game, which proves that this is a name only kind of thing. Ice to the Invincible with just a smidge over 1 billion health. Ice to is weaker than every other boss that I listed to this point, except for the Valkyries. He also doesn't do a whole lot. He's kind of like the Master G of raid bosses in Borderlands 3, except you can actually shoot him and he was too smart to have any gates installed near his entrance. Ista does, however, drop the Skull Master and DLC 2 class mods. To fight Ista, you need to do the We Slash missions that he gives you. On the final one, you will get the Invincible version of Ista. You can also cheese him for easier loot by killing him on your first ever run and then not reviving him. Then when you save, quit, and load back in, you run over to his arena. He'll still be in fight for his life, but he will have dropped whatever drops he can give you on that run. Now, Ista will usually give you a bunch of garbage, but he does have a 15% chance to drop the Skull Masher, which is well worth the farm. So there you have it. That is 17 raid boss level enemies in Borderlands 3. Just because they aren't labeled invincible doesn't mean that they're not raid bosses. And in Ista's case, even if they are labeled invincible, they're barely raid bosses. Real quick, I want to give a huge shout out to Lone Masterino for his assistance in getting all these numbers and Shadow Evil for showing me the tools with which I can look at this data myself. These guys were invaluable for making this video. Do me a favor, go to the description right now, click on their links go give them a subscription real quick on youtube they're absolutely worth it they make some great content hope you guys enjoyed this video let me know in the comment section down below which raid bosses are your favorite thank you guys for watching take care